Uh, my name is Dr. Lewis Clark. I'm a rehab doctor in Clear Lake, Texas. I work as the corporate director of research, neurodegenerative disease, and traumatic brain injury for a corporation called PAM Health. So this is what I treat. Um, so this is an example of that wobby. You can see that each successive 30 days, we show new red lines. What are those red lines? Those red lines are new connections being made across the brain. Each one of those dots is an electrode on that helmet. We can also see it in strokes. So you can see even where the stroke is. Look at this post-COVID. Now we're finding out that after COVID, we're seeing like 10% of the people that have COVID are having these post-COVID syndromes, mostly characterized by this mental fog and they don't know where they are. Some of them are completely debilitated. So let's talk about this destructive sequence because that's really where it all begins. It really has uh, three parts to it. The first stage is uh, cell membrane disruption. The second stage is uh, these releases of the neurotoxins in the cell. And the third stage is the body trying to fix it. So in the first stage, the free radicals release is um, a disruption of the membrane in not only the cell membrane, but in the mitochondria. You see this potassium, sodium, potassium pump uh, quits working. Its job is to pump out sodium and pump in its potassium. That's how it maintains its electrochemical gradient so it can continue to make an action potential. So what happens then is as those reactive oxygen species happen, more water fills the cell, the cell explodes. Guess what happens after that? All the contents of that cell are dumped into the extracellular fluid and now you've got another host of free radicals going crazy and damaging the cell after that and the cell next to that. So pretty soon you've got this cascade of events and each one of them is feeding off the other. At the same time, if you're destroying astrocytes and glia, which are the support system for the neurons, they contain glutamate, their job, which is a neurotoxin if it's in the extracellular space. Glutamate is a great excitatory neurotransmitter. It gets us off our chairs, it gets us moving. But if it's released indiscriminately into the extra, uh, extracellular space, it binds to receptors on the neurons and it kills them. So now you have these neurotoxins released. That receptor is called the NMDA receptor. This is a normal cell releasing its glutamate, the astrocytes happy doing that. And then finally, it self-destructs and the astrocyte can't cope, the neuron can't cope, and it explodes. So now you get these three components that are, are happening, killing off these cells. And finally, you have this moving in of cytokines. And if you guys don't know anything about cytokines after this pandemic, you need to take a refresher course at school because it's everywhere. So you have interleukin-6, interleukin uh, uh, 1B, all of these are inflammatory cytokines in this, and cytokines are good in that they stimulate the body to start the repair process. So there's healthy cytokines too, and you look at 10, for example. So those cytokines you want, and but most of the ones that are released in this cell damage are going to be uh, inflammatory, and they're going to be uh, uh, causing more and more destruction. So everything feeds on itself. So we've got to block this cycle somewhere. First of all, I would say we got to stop the, the free radicals. We've got to increase the antioxidants. Uh, so we've got to block the release and the receptors, these NMDA receptors for neurotoxins. We've got to release, stop the release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. These are six of the 18 uh, parts of that. And you can see each one of those addresses uh, the free radicals. Uh, PQQ is a supplement that actually stimulates new brain growth as well, but in this case, we're using it to suppress these reactive oxygen species. Menaquinone 6, 7, which is vitamin K2, it abolishes reactive oxygen species. And that's exactly what we want to scavenge. Vitamin D, it, it inhibits the metals that come out. When you damage a cell, you have a release of iron, zinc, and copper. Those form free radicals that are incredibly toxic to the cell next to it. Astiocarnitine and CoQ10, you know about those. Astiocarnitine is how you make energy in the mitochondria from fat. Uh, CoQ10 is how you make it from oxygen and sugar, to be simplistic about it. 
Melatonin is the brain's neuroprotector. It is the brain antioxidant that protects from you from everything. So the second step in intervening in this is to suppress these neurotoxins. So look, the very same six do that. PQ2, it decreases that NMDA. Remember you talked about the NMDA receptor? It, it blocks that. The vitamin K2 protects that oligodendrocyte. You know what an oligodendrocyte? Anybody know what an oligodendrocyte is? It's the cell that makes the myelin sheath around the axon. We want oligodendrocytes to be preserved. Not only the neuron, but the insulation so it doesn't short out in, in simplistic terms. Vitamin K2 does that. Now vitamin D, it blocks that calcium influx that kills the mitochondria and again has to carnitine CoQ10, inhibits the NMDA receptor, and melatonin inhibits that NMDA. So we're blocking the neurotoxin. So up to this point, we've blocked the free radical, which is where we wanted to intervene. Now we've also been able to intervene with these same six little uh, chemicals in blocking the neurotoxin if either the receptors and or the release of that. Finally, we want to uh, block these inflammatory cytokines. So the same six. What a surprise. What an amazing thing. PQQ, it suppresses interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein. Vitamin K2 suppresses interleukin-6 and all the genes in the uh, microglia that crank out the uh, antioxidants, it cranks them up. Vitamin D as well, interleukin-6. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, a big one. Um, so you've heard about all of these things in the light of the pandemic and the cytokines that they're trying to, to save the patient from. Remember, it's a symphony though. It is not just the single drug. I mean, do you know how much stock went down on Biogen when they failed their Alzheimer's drug uh, two or three years ago? So now we block this destructive process. What are we going to do next? We got to rebuild it. How are we going to do that? That's this wonderful aspect of neurosteroids. I'm not going to go into it in depth, but progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, guess what? They're, they suppress neuroinflammation. So the basic hormone replacement therapy that you hear so much about in these lectures uh, at this meeting are the very things we need to preserve that brain tissue. Back to this receptor that if that is present in these stem cells that are still floating around in our heads, they bind to the sigma-1 receptor, and they stimulate these stem cells to become neurons. And this is not revelation. We've known about this for a while, but who uses it, except me. So you can see the, the thought and source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, look at that. Interactive, uh, inter uh, neuroactive steroids such as DHEA, and pregnenolone activate the receptor. Um, DHEA, I looked at it, the Journal of Pharmacism, uh, Pharmacologic Sciences. Look, excit excitotoxicity they're talking about, oxidative damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, everything we just talked about. And at the end it says, therapeutic potential in the treatment of various neurodegenerative disorders could benefit from working with these sigma-1 receptors. So this is not new science, it's something you can use. But if you want to catalyze that whole sequence of events, the growth hormone that Dave was talking about a minute ago, it is, it is undeniably the most powerful catalyst for, for making all of this work. We know that because there are thousands of studies studying growth hormone, neuroinflammation, and neurogenesis. But here's the problem with growth hormone. First, you've got a, a regulatory issue that David alluded to. But the other problem is that we don't have much when we get old. Look at that. By the time we're 40, uh, we're pretty low. So you can benefit from that not only in the neurologic uh, sciences, but also in cardiovascular function. All the organs respond. All the organs return to youthful function. And it, it is fascinating to watch kidney function reverse. So you can regenerate whole body systems with it. Well, the brain is no different. So, how do you do that? How do you diagnose a person with growth hormone deficiency? Well, these are the characteristics. You're going to need to know that because when you prescribe growth hormone in a patient, you need to have that in your chart that these are the symptoms that this patient is complaining of. And 
Do you know any Alzheimer's patient that doesn't have at least five or six of these? Do you know any Parkinson's patient that doesn't have at least five or six of these? No, you don't. So when you start uh, being able to document that this patient is suffering from the symptom, and you have uh, classic physical changes in their bodies with the loss of muscle mass and strength, then it would, it's very easy to justify what you're going to do. The next step, though, is you're going to have to, to document with levels. But here's the neurologic stuff that, that is probably more salient to this discussion. Look at what it does. It increases protein synthesis in the neurons, the oligodendrocytes, I love that word, and I want you all to say it over and over as you leave this word. Um, it regenerates, it promotes neuronal survival, neurogenesis, that's the making of new neurons, myelin, which is what the oligodendrocyte does, and synaptogenesis, angiogenesis, so it's growing new cells, new, new vessels into the uh, parenchyma of the brain, which after an ischemic stroke is incredibly important. We know, and these are all documented, learning, memory, neuroprotection, uh, decreases neuroinflammation, neuroprotection in experimental Parkinson's, hypoxic injury. So growth hormone has actions of its own. Not only does it stimulate the regrowth of things, but it also does its own neuroprotection and blocking of uh, cytokines. It decreases uh, beta amyloid, which of course we all know about it from uh, an Alzheimer's standpoint, and it increases it decreases that excitotoxicity of glutamate and NMDA. Uh, it, um, uh, oh, the neuroinflammation, that's the one I wanted to say to you. So we block all of those things that we talked about initially in the destructive sequence, just with growth hormone alone. But here's the rub. The rub is we got to document it. So we already talked about documenting symptoms, right? Uh, the problem with that is that uh, they're very strict about numbers. The, the ones that they recommend testing, they go by insulin growth factor one, and that level has to be outside the range. Now, in my experience, back in the 90s, uh, IGF-1 level ranges, the acceptable ranges, were like 120 to 500. Well, over the years, they, they morphed downward. So now we've got a range of, what is that, 52 to 328? Well, nobody's going to qualify for growth hormone because most of us are, are low. But look, this guy, who's in his 40, late 40, his IGF-1 is 84. Uh, and, but look at the Z-score. Z-score is minus 1.1. So what is a Z-score? This is your ace in the hole. Because a Z distribution is a bell curve, just like you would see in the classroom. Somebody's going to make an A, somebody's going to make an F, and they're at two different tails of the curve. So don't just count on that idea of one level, because it might lead you to say, well, you know, I can't get to growth hormone. So then there's a the question of doses. Well, the, the insert for growth hormone, you can read that for yourself. Most of the males will start about 0.4 milligrams, which in terms of units, you multiply the unit, the milligrams by three, so it's like one, uh, 1. 1.2, uh, and that's usually a starting dose for most of the males. And women only need more because their, growth, their female hormones kind of interfere with them. Let's say you can't justify it, you don't have enough data to really say, yeah, you definitely, I, I know I can get this hands down from the compounding pharmacy. You can use secretagogs. Green guys are really neat because what they are are amino acids that stimulate the pituitary to squeeze out growth hormone. And uh, those levels will come up. And you can see a dramatic change if you use them. This one is called a secret trophin, and it's really effective. Uh, and you can, drop, you can drive your IGF-1 up uh, sometimes several points if you just use uh, this secreted guy. So it's a lot more cost effective than growth hormone. Sometimes you can use a combination of the two. So you're not using quite as much growth hormone if you add the secretagogue too, so you can get that growth hormone level up. And you'll see benefits. You'll see these people wake up. They've got several clinical studies that demonstrate it. Uh, it's in the physician's office, so, so they can't just get it over the counter. You have to diagnose a need for it, and, and they can buy it from you. So this combination is probably the, the single best combination for any neurodegenerative disease. TBI, post-COVID syndrome, that mental fog, 
all the things that you've read about and seen in your clinics, um, this is a good dynamite combination. That's all I got.